nice to be with you again on this Wednesday night. I hope in spite of the restrictions, you had a great Easter period and you sensed the risen Christ with you. Whatever may be going on in your life at the minute, you have sensed his resurrection power with you. We are going to have a kind of series over the next few weeks on Wednesday evenings called Repercussions of the Resurrection. And we're going to be looking at what the resurrection has actually achieved, repercussions of it for the church and how relevant that is for today. And tonight I'm going to be looking at, uh, the title is The Promise, The Promise of the Spirit, which Jesus obviously said would be the case after he rose again. Anyway, here I am still in the craft room and uh, I wanted to make you a promise today. We're talking about promises of the Spirit. Well, I want to make you a promise today and here it is. When we finally get back to normal, I promise you our first Sunday together will be a time of celebration that God brought us through. Would that be a good thing to do? I hope so. And here's the rule that we're going to have on that day. The rule at our celebration service will be that you are not allowed to move your chair any further than five inches away from the next person. Social undistancing will be part of our time together. Well, I'm still in this craft room. I've got my little pink stereo, super loud, favourite colour. And Brenda, if you're worrying at all, I want you to know that I've found your marigolds, all right? So everything's great, everything's going fine. As you can see, I've been in here too long, doing too many talks, and now I'm coming up with some strange things. But anyway, I hope it made you smile. Now, I'm going to be looking at John 14, verse 15 to 21, and John 16, verse 5 to 15. But don't worry, I'm not going to go through every verse because there's quite a few there, which means there'll be rejoicing in certain households. But what I'm going to try and do is paint a bit of a picture using John's words out of those chapters about the Holy Spirit and who the Holy Spirit is and the Spirit being the promise, of course, to the church. So that's what we're going to do today. Let me pray. Father, we thank you so much for the time of Easter and for resurrection. And we want to pray today that you would give us a revelation from your scriptures about the Holy Spirit and all that the Holy Spirit means from the book of John. We do ask this, Lord, because we so need your true spirit in these days. Your church worldwide needs your true spirit. Not fake stuff, not pretense or deceptive stuff, but the real Holy Spirit. So we ask today, you would indeed empower us to know you more. Amen. Now, have you ever lost someone very dear to you? It might be through death. It might be because they moved away. It could be that changes in life have somehow created, you know what it is, that busyness that we all get caught up in and somehow just because of being ultra busy, you've lost contact with someone. But I'm sure there are many people who I'm speaking to right now who have lost someone very dear to them. And that loss has cost them very deeply. And actually that person, if we're honest, is irreplaceable. There are unique people we meet in our lives, unique in so many ways, but when we lose them, it really, really hurts. For me, there's several people I've lost in my life. And even now, underneath, that means quite a lot and is deep. But let me ask a question. How about Jesus? How about him? Let me paint a bit of a picture for us. Before anything was made, Jesus existed in a non-human form. 
In the splendour of heaven, Father, Son and Spirit dwelt in perfect unity. He was the Word of God, was Jesus, and still is, of course. He is the Logos, the one who is God, the one who was God. Indeed, Jesus is the creator of all things, John 1, 3. He is the person, the reason why things are. He's the purpose. Purpose. As the word of God, Jesus also speaks the word of God. Everything that God ever wanted to say was fulfilled by him and said by him. Jesus actually reveals God. He shows us what the Father is like. Jesus narrates the Father and explains him. Also, Jesus demonstrates the Father because he's the walking, talking, God-made flesh man. He makes God known and knowable on a first-hand basis to all who would believe and receive. And this Jesus delivered, he rescued, he revealed truth, and he was the truth. He was not just a way, but the way. He was not just a life, but the life. And he is God in person and in action. And in looks, really. Because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. John 14, verse 8. What a statement. As John 1, 18 sums it up and says, Jesus is unique, literally one of a single kind. So that's who Jesus is. So Jesus is incredible. He also turned water into wine. John 2. He made a man who was born blind see. John 9. Jesus said, you need to eat bread and wine. Eat and drink of me. John 6. And he said he would pour water out from which we would never thirst. John 4 and John 7. And he said that we needed to abide in him, live in him, live through him. And like branches on a vine, Intimately linked into the life flow of Jesus Christ is what you and I individually and together should do and be. Without him, we can do nothing. John 15 verse 5. And we must be born again. John 3 3. Remember Nicodemus? He came to Jesus at night because he was scared of his fellow leaders. He came at night because he wanted to be discovered. But Nicodemus was actually in himself in the night. He was dark within But what he needed was the light of the world, Jesus Christ, to shine upon him and in him. Sign after sign Jesus gave, pointing to who he was, pointing to who God was. Can you imagine being with someone like that? I know the people we've met in our lives have been important, especially ones we've perhaps lost. But can you imagine being with Jesus? Can you imagine walking around with someone like him? Can you imagine... Just sitting there, listening, watching, taking in all the sort of sense of what he was doing. Can you sense the experiences you would have had if you sat there and watched him and seeing those eyes lighting up with such beautiful spiritual sight and the way he looked in his face? Can you imagine being there? But then... The ultimate shock. One day Jesus said, I am leaving you. Disciples, I'm leaving you. John 14, 18. Can you imagine their faces when he said that? The one they put their trust in. The one in which the whole world seemed to revolve around and was all about suddenly saying, I'm going away. I'm going back to the one who sent me, back to the Father. And you're not going to see me anymore. John 16, verse 5. Can you imagine the grief? Literally, the the word grief there literally means their hearts were filled with sorrow, filled with heaviness. They were in a place of brokenness, a place that they've never been in before. But what is more extraordinary than that is this. Jesus then says the most extraordinary thing. He says, 
it is good for you that I go away. It's good for you that I leave. I mean, what extraordinary words. Jesus, the one who I just described and more, the one they have been with all that time, then says, it's good that I'm going to leave you. How can Jesus leaving anybody be good? But that's what he said in John 16, verse 6. It is good that Jesus went because it was then and only then that the promised Holy Spirit could be released and sent into our world. That is why it's good. And the amazing thing about it is that this repercussion from Jesus' resurrection meant that the power of God and the work of Jesus could shift from just being in one location at one time to the world and worldwide. God was going to be able to move universally in a way that could not have happened before without the sending of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit empowered believers were going to be the ones who would spread the message and tell others about Jesus Christ. So let there be no doubt, Jesus is so sure that the sending of his Spirit is good that he's actually Jesus himself who sent the Spirit. John 15, 26 and John 16, 7. The Spirit is also sent in Christ's name, John 15, 26. And in 14, verse 16, the Son asks the Father to send the Spirit. And actually, in that particular passage, the Spirit goes out or proceeds from the Father. So over and over again, we see this incredible connectedness in the book of John. And it's particularly clear here. We see the Father, we see the Son, and we see the Holy Spirit all working together. The Trinity is surely at work in this worldwide kingdom work. And it still involves the Spirit convicting people over sin, righteousness and judgment. John 16, 9. Just like it always did and always should. It's vitally important that the Spirit will always remind believers of what Jesus taught, verse 14, chapter 14, verse 26. And indeed, the Spirit will never, ever contradict the literal truth of God's word. He is a spirit of truth and he is a truth speaker, John 14, 17, John 15, 26 and John 16, 13. And you know, I'm going to say this, I think it's so important we remember that the Holy Spirit never ever contradicts or contravenes God's word, never. There are lots of things in the world these days, and we've had them in the past, and they'll no doubt happen again, where there's been some kind of revivalistic movement. I want to say the test of these things, the test of the Spirit there, is does the Spirit honour the literal truth of the Scriptures? That's what counts. It's so important that when we get into the things of the Holy Spirit, it is a Spirit that is always a biblical one. Nothing more and nothing less. And it's not a strange thing when you consider it, because if Jesus said, I am the truth, then really the Spirit should bear witness to the truth that Jesus is. It's all those things together. Forever and always, the Spirit will defend the Bible's exact definition of Jesus in his being and in his doings. But also the spirit, not just a spirit of truth and these other things that we've said, not just a spirit of judgment and righteousness and other things like that. The spirit is also a spirit with his own unique title. Now, many of you have heard this many times before, but in the New International Version, the NIV, sometimes regarded as the nearly imperfect version, but anyway, won't upset anybody. But the truth of the matter is, the NIV translates the title of the, of the Spirit as the Counselor, the Counselor. Now, if you've been around the church for any time, any length of time at all, you will have also discovered that other translations exist. Advocate, 
comforter or helper. The Greek word behind that is paraclete, which some of you older members may have heard of in the past as well. The Holy Spirit is the paraclete, the advocate, the comforter, the helper, the counsellor. Literally, it means, paraclete literally means, he is the one who is called alongside the believer in order to help, strengthen and comfort, to speak on their behalf. So that's a great thing, the Holy Spirit acting in that way for you and me and those who believe. All of that is God's promise to his church, a repercussion of the resurrection. I don't know how many of you noticed, but uh, the camera is gradually slipping down um, as I was talking. So I think I was looking shorter or taller, depending on which way you look at it. We have such professional equipment around here, you would not believe it. I think, Clive, I'm going to need some more black insulating tape to hold this together. Anyway, I wanted to say, as I get towards the end of this talk, really, that for me, the Holy Spirit, the gift that God has given to his church, the person of the Spirit, is absolutely indispensable. Without the Spirit, we would not have even become Christians in the first place. Without the Spirit, the work of Jesus would not have continued. Without the Spirit, we wouldn't see miracles. We wouldn't sense the presence of the Lord on Sundays. The Spirit of God is so amazing and so able to do more than we can ask or imagine. And I don't think we have a real clue, if I'm honest, about what the Holy Spirit can really do. If he is to continue the work of Jesus, then surely that is an extraordinary thing. Imagine what the work of Jesus would be right now if Jesus was physically on earth at this moment. And then think about that's the kind of thing that the Spirit of God really wants to be doing. You know, Jesus is as close to us as ever. We just can't see it with our physical eyes, but he is here by his spirit, a phrase we use so often. Church, do we really live like that is true? Do we really live like it? Sometimes I ask questions like that to help us work stuff out. Here are some more, and I hope you might mind me sharing them with you. It just I'm just trying to help us sort of pin things down a bit. I think lots of Christians understand Jesus to to, to quite a degree. We can talk about Jesus and we can understand what he did, what he said, those sort of things. I think people can grasp something of the Father as well. But I'm not really sure we grasp very easily things to do with the Spirit. How many of us really understand the Spirit and what he's doing and what he wants to do? How many of us have got the Spirit at the centre of our lives every day? Do we really appreciate how important he is for the heart of our faith and all that God is wanting to do in the world? How critical he is in bringing all of whom Jesus is to us and to the world. The camera's slipping again. There we are, I think that's a bit better. Do we really know how to listen to the Spirit's voice? You know, there's an amazing verse in this passage, John 14, verse 20, and it says this, On that day you will realise that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. I mentioned this verse the other day, actually. On that day you will realise that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. It seems to me that the relationship between the Father and Jesus And us and Jesus and Jesus in us is what Christianity is truly all about through the person of the Holy Spirit. There is something in this verse so deep that we need to grasp that it's to do with this Father, Son, Spirit relationship working away that's ours through the Holy Spirit this very, very moment. Jesus said on that day you will realise the truth of this verse. Maybe, my friends, we need today to have a greater realisation of what that really means. You know, John 14, 17 said about the Spirit, that the Spirit would be living with us and would be in us. 
the Father and Jesus said they would make their home in us in John 14, 23. I want to ask, what kind of Christianity is this? It seems so different from a lot of what goes on in our church traditions. It really is an amazing, amazing thing. And I think love is also at the heart of this passage. Love is there as a special underpinning word, really, in these two passages. It's repeatedly mentioned. And for me, it is a loving Jesus that gives way to obeying him, John 14, 21. Our obedience should not come from our duty, but from our love. Loving gives way to the right kind of living because it's relationally based. Relational to the Father, the Son and the Spirit and to each other as believers. Do you know that verse, the, uh, I'm in the Father and you're in me and I'm in you and all the other verses I've mentioned a moment ago, just a moment ago, have all got plural yous in it. They're not singular yous, they are plural use. This is about all of us, believers together as one people. It is being community this way. It's about the Holy Spirit really moving through every person in every part of the church. The Holy Spirit bringing us closer to the Father and to the Son and through the Son to know the Father more deeply. It's for us to come into the promise and the realisation that the Holy Spirit is at work and is wanting to do great things in this world. Maybe this is part of what it means to go deeper, to have deeper roots into the Lord. So maybe we should go deeper, yes, deeper still, into the Lord God. And realise that the type of Christianity these verses are talking about is where we need to increasingly be. I don't want a Western type Christianity. I don't want something that's institutional and caught up in religious things. I want the real thing. Because for me, where the real thing is, is where we will see men and women, boys and girls coming to faith and truly experience in Jesus for themselves. Hallelujah. We have got the promised spirit of God and he is ours. May it be that we truly enter further into all that that means. Let's pray. Father God, I think we need a revelation of this truth today. There's a lot of things in here and if we read the passage, it's quite detailed. But I'm asking Father, that we would know the spirit of truth, the biblical spirit of truth, and we would not be frightened to move a bit more into these things of the Holy Spirit, because wherever the true spirit is, we will never stray from truth, and we will always be secure. All I know is, in these days, there is something that your Holy Spirit wants to be doing through us, and in this area and beyond. And so we pray, give us a revelation, Take us onto a level that's not based on traditions and religions, but, Lord, based on a true walking with the Spirit of God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you and thanks for your time.